Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us uh, from around the world. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here for this very, very important conversation. Um, I know the uh, the announcement indicated that Maxim Temchenko would be joining us. Um, he unfortunately was was unable to join us at the last minute. He has a uh, a very important matter to address. Um, operating uh, the largest private electricity company in a country that is in the middle of a war uh, is very demanding, as you might imagine. Uh, but we are very fortunate to have with us uh, Dimitra Sakarik. He is the executive director of DTEC. Um, and actually uh, held the CEO position uh, for a brief time uh, in the past. Uh, he has been instrumental in the efforts uh, in Ukraine to deal with uh, the challenges of operating the electrical system during a time of war. So as most of you know, in February on February 24th of this year, uh, Russia uh, launched a large-scale invasion of Ukraine, which is challenging on many levels, a humanitarian level, um, a civil order level, um, and and quite frankly, as well, the, the 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 operation of the energy system. And that is really what we're here to talk about today, primarily. Um, but uh, keeping the lights on is critical. Keeping the heat flowing is critical. So electric, electricity service is critical. And we are entering, um, you know, the time of year when it is most critical. In particular, it's getting colder, winter is approaching, and um, keeping systems operating is of uh, critical importance for uh, for the populace in, in, in Ukraine. Um, as will be discussed, uh, the Ukrainian people, uh, DTEC, um, its, its workforce has been incredibly resilient and shown remarkable strength throughout this entire time. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the conversation that Anna Mikulska, uh will moderate with, with Dimitro. Um, the, uh, uh, the reason Anna will actually moderate this is this is just a little ad for, for some stuff that we're doing. We have formalized some work that we uh, uh, have been performing for quite some time, focused on the Eurasia region um, into a program, um, Energy and Geopolitics in Eurasia. Uh, uh, Anna will be co-leading that program with Gabe Collins. Um, so um, just want to let you guys all know that because quite frankly, there's going to be a lot more to come. It is a very active region of the world with Ukraine uh, right in the middle of it. Uh, not just now, but for for many years into the future. So um, I look forward to the conversation. Dimitra, thank you again for joining us. Um, right now, we'll go ahead and run that video, and then Anna will take it from there. Only those unscared of darkness dare to descend in the dark. Restore the connection. Those unscared of darkness get through the night. Meant with the bare hands or with a key. Under the ground, fire and rain. They batter, plague in. They don't sleep to seek, to connect, to bring the light. Be the light. Only those unscared of darkness, aren't scared to stay in the night. Well, it's all for people. Since the start of the world till nowadays, at all times, only those unscared of darkness could bring the light. DTEC, brave to bring the light. Well, many, th many thanks, Ken, for the introduction. And Dimitra, we really appreciate you being here, taking this time from your extremely busy day, I'm sure, and um, to tell us about what you do and how you uh, deal with all the um, issues that you're facing now uh, in Ukraine. Um, Suava Ukraini, uh, please give your remarks, opening remarks. Hello, uh, Slava. Thank you very much for uh, having me uh, uh, here. So I will try to be brief in my introduction remarks and uh, probably better to go through the questions that you have. Um, so yesterday was the fifth wave of attacks uh, by Russians uh, uh, to the energy infrastructure. Uh, that attack was the biggest uh, since the invasion started uh, in February. Uh, they launched more than uh, 100 uh, missiles and drones, uh, and um, 
although the majority uh, of the rockets, uh, missiles, uh, and drones were hit by the anti uh, anti missile systems, uh, more than 20 missiles uh, attacked the critical infrastructure. They mainly destroyed uh, yesterday. They mainly destroyed the substations connecting the high voltage substation connecting the energy system together. Um, uh, also, some generation facilities, uh, said facilities were also damaged. Uh, one of uh, DTEC uh, thermal power power plants uh, uh, were attacked um, and uh, damaged, uh, stopped its operation. As a result of uh, the attacks yesterday, there was a critical, so-called crucial, crucial uh, disaster. In automation, automation worked. Uh, the some generation facilities were switched off automatically, and some of the uh, regions of Ukraine were kind of uh, disintegrated from the United Energy System. Uh, for some time, uh, for some time, the uh, integration with the European Energy System was broken. And um, some regions were working as islands uh, without or with generation without uh, within those islands. Um, as of today, as of today, uh, still we have a lot of people without uh, light. Uh, a lot of uh, regions uh, have uh, more than half uh, half of uh, customers uh, out of uh, energy supply. The majority of critical infrastructure, like water um, uh, supply, um, like uh, sewage, uh, like heating, connection, uh, the uh, law uh, enforcement agencies, state uh, authorities, uh, they are they are uh, with uh, stay with power right now. But uh, the households and businesses uh, are still without power. Mm, the energy specialist uh, uh, working to first uh, to understand what happening, how severe what the damage, what is uh, possible, uh, what can be switched on right now without repairing, what uh, should be repaired, mm, and how to, how much time uh, would it take to do that. Mm, uh, unfortunately, the attacks uh, were numerous. And a lot of regions uh, in the center, in the west uh, of Ukraine, um, are without uh, with, with, significantly with, without uh, power supply. Uh, so, I guess it will take time to to recover, um, because, uh, for example, after the first uh, waves, uh, it took uh, it took uh, up to one month, uh, two three weeks to at least to catch up to recover. Um, of course, after the all, uh, all each attack, the resilience uh, and readiness to recover is uh, getting worse because we just take uh, take our resources uh, to substitute, for example, damaged equipment to um, uh, repair it using the components. Uh, and uh, I think that this time it would we would need more time to. Uh, to recover at least to the level where, where we were before the the attacks um, to basically to move forward uh, through the winter uh, we need three things to do first it's to have a effective uh, effective uh, effective air defense and physical protection of the equipment air defense is definitely uh, the most important one uh, civil protection of the of the equipment with uh, concrete blocks, for example, uh, big bags, uh, sandbags, etc., uh, also needed. But this is against a secondary, uh, let's say, damage because of the explosion, ex explosive waves, for example, or other small uh, the the secondary secondary um, uh, damage. Mm -hmm. Then we also need uh, this is the first thing. Then we also need uh, uh, equipment ready. To change uh, to substitute damaged equipment uh, for this, we need a we need a very very coordinated uh, activity. Um, a lot of political declarations already uh, we hear that uh, many countries, many companies are ready to provide this equipment, and we are very very thank you, thankful for that. But now it's time to organize a clear winter action plan in order to coordinate all. American, European, and other international stakeholders together. 
uh, it's let's say let's call it energy Rammstein should be created to 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 go through that winter action plan um, because uh, too many players right now, too many participants, too many people ready and companies ready to help, and without a clear coordination of this process, it will be very difficult to be quick and precise to set priorities right to um, in right to distribute the uh, equipment in the right way to organize people uh, mechanism uh, in the right way and to ensure a quick recovery. Uh, the centralized reserve of equipment should be created within this process in order to have a pool of equipment ready to be installed. And uh, also we need um, to support financially the market players because everything um, that we are doing it's not for free. We need to buy equipment. So, uh, we need to buy supplies. Uh, uh, so there are several uh, issues on the market should be resolved in order to be to to increase the resilience of the energy system uh, during the winter plan, uh, winter time. I'm sure that we will go through the winter. We have no other choice. Uh, it will be not easy, but I'm confident that uh, together. Uh, Ukrainians and uh, our partners from from other countries uh, uh, basically will work together efficiently and we will uh, be able to get through that. So that is basically the the uh, broad picture. And if uh, you have a specific question, we can just touch base every every interesting point just to be more to go into more details. Thank you so much, Dmitro. I just want to also to uh, remind the audience that they can actually ask their questions in the Q and A, uh, uh, in the Q and A, and we will ask uh, later those questions um, uh, after uh, after the, the our chat with Dmitro. Um, so I think you know what you're speaking to is really to the resiliency of both the Ukrainian people and Ukrainian grid. And um, I think that's extremely, it's almost unbelievable because we all know how difficult it is to live without electricity when we just lose, um, you know, we lose our power for several hours or a day or two, which happens in the US, but that is a very difficult situation. Um, Ukrainians live that every single day for months now. And it seems from what you're saying, it's becoming even worse. Um, as you say, you will go for the winter, it's going to be very difficult. Um, one thing that I wanted to, because you've mentioned this um, in, in, your, uh, in, in your remarks, you mentioned the EU connection, because I think it's very interesting, um, interesting element of, that, of the situation. Um, Ukraine was not connected to EU grid when Russia has attacked. However, it was preparing for it for years. Uh, within very short period of time, Ukraine was able to connect, which again, speaks to the amazing abilities of the Ukrainian um, uh, energy companies and people. And um, it actually has been at some point even selling uh, energy to, to the EU. How is it, how is it possible? Um, how, how does it work with the EU system? How do you work with the EU? Um, what do, does it help in to what extent and how you are helping as well? Indeed, it's an incredible and very interesting uh, story. Uh, that's probably uh, not uh, everybody may live through. Uh, so um, Ukraine was preparing uh, to disconnect its energy system from Russian and Belarusian systems and uh, synchronize it with EU and TSUE system. And there were planned two uh, testing periods. And the, interestingly enough, the first testing period started uh, two hours before the war started. Basically, on uh, February 24th at three o'clock in the morning, uh, the U Ukrainian energy system was disconnected from Russian and uh, Belarusian systems. And in two hours, uh, Russian started the war. And the idea of the testing system, uh, the testing period was to uh, understand whether during three days, Ukrainian energy system may um, balance itself and work uh, separately from Russian and Euro Belarusian system and European system, so in isolated mode, let's say. And it appeared that uh, we managed to, to work uh, properly, um, thanks to the professionalism of uh, Ukrainian energy uh, companies. And um, 
um, after the war started, it became clear that nobody is going to reconnect to Russian the Russian uh, system back, and uh, the acting acting uh, um, uh, acting campaign started to connect as quickly as possible to EU uh, energy system. And in May, in March 14th, uh, so sorry, 16th, that happened. Ukrainian energy system was synchronized together with Moldova, was synchronized to NTSOE grid. And since that, uh, we are working in parallel uh, as a united uh, single energy system from, um, let's say, uh, eastern part of Ukraine to Portugal. And uh, until, uh, until uh, Zaporizhka nuclear plant was in the grid, a Ukrainian energy system was a uh, prophecy uh, system. Basically, due to the drop of consumption, we had extra power to export. And since beginning of uh, the June uh, this year, uh, and the SOE allowed to uh, allowed commercial exports of uh, of electricity to Europe, basically to Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, and Poland. Um, that was started from 100 megawatt increased up to 400, and it was a successful case because thanks to the thanks to that export uh, of electricity, Ukrainian energy system received badly needed uh, resources to uh, fund itself. Uh, but when Russians uh, destroyed the grid connection uh, between the Zaporizhia nuclear plant and Ukrainian energy system. And the system became profit deficit, and the export was stopped in October of 10 due to the lack of uh, due to the lack of uh, generation facilities. Right now, we don't uh, we don't export due to the lack of generation, and of course because of the big damage uh, that uh, occurred during the attacks. And that's why um, right now we. Uh, physically connected to European energy system, but uh, the inflows and outflows are mainly technological. They are not commercial, and um, we don't expect that uh, export uh, resume until uh, the um, uh, Ukrainian army uh, deliberate the uh, Zaporizhia region, where the uh, Zaporizhia nuclear uh, plant is located, and we uh, bring it back into the Ukrainian energy system. Right. And uh, you've also mentioned in your opening remarks about the specific attacks on uh, on the infrastructure. Um, it seems both of it, the connecting infrastructure, the grid connections, but uh, you also mentioned probably more uh, more, more dangerous um, than, uh, damage to the generation facilities. Um, what assistance uh, does Ukraine receive to help uh, with those power outages? You've mentioned there is some assistance uh, in terms of equipment, service, Services, um, and what does Ukraine need now, um, given all that's been happening, particularly from October when attacks have uh, intensified? What type of equipment, what, what, what type of assistance does Ukraine need uh, so Ukraine can make it in the best shape possible throughout the winter and, um, uh, and going forward? Uh, yes, uh, since the uh, war started, uh, the main damage uh, was... Uh, um, uh, the, the, the mainly low, low voltage uh, uh, grid uh, was damaged basically as a distribution of local companies, uh, energy companies uh, in Kyiv, Oblast, for example, Kyiv region, and Kyiv itself, and the Chernigov, Sumy, Kharkiv regions. So it's a low voltage uh, transformers, uh, wires, uh, connectors, uh, piles. So um, a lot of companies uh, helped. Uh, uh, with that equipment, we were buying it, uh, we were receiving it as a technical assistance, uh, as a humanitarian aid, and that mechanism uh, is working now. Uh, but the specific of that, of that equipment uh, and all spare parts that was delivered, that they are more commodity, it's very easy to buy it, it's uh, common uh, in the market, and our specifications are very similar to European and even American specifications. Uh, after the attacks started uh, in October, uh, mainly high voltage uh, equipment uh, is being damaged, i.e. the auto transformers, high voltage auto transformers, just uh, transform current transformers, uh, the, the switchers, uh, circuit breakers, that equipment that usually uh, you can imagine staying in the uh, switch yards near the thermal generation plants, uh, 
uh, nuclear plants, uh, uh, hydro plants, or at the big, uh, big substations where the uh, as an uh, which serves as a connecting points of various parts of uh, of the energy system as uh, a high voltage. In Ukraine, the specific is that the, the class uh, the the class of uh, voltage is uh, 750. This is the highest uh, highest uh, highest level 750 kilovolt. Then 330, 220, 150. It's been different from European, where we have the highest one 400 kilovolt, and then the next level is 200 kilovolt. Mm, that means that uh, it would be impossible to buy just equipment in Europe because uh, there is different uh, different class of uh, voltage. If we are talking about frequency, we have 50 gears as in Europe. Uh, in the States, they have 60 gears, so a different uh, frequency. And um, usually these uh, pieces of high voltage equipment is uh, designed and produced specifically for a particular substation or particular thermal a uh, nuclear hydro plant uh, because of the specific uh, specific needs that should be addressed. And uh, since it's very expensive equipment, we're talking about auto transformers or current transformers, it's uh, maybe 20, 15, 10 million dollars or euros each. Then um, usually producers like ABB, Schneider, uh, Siemens, uh, Hitachi and others, uh, they don't produce uh, in stock. They uh, get the order, procure components, uh, get the specification, and all the components went into the specification, then manufacture that piece of equipment and deliver to the customer. And the procurement time or lead time, usually it's uh, from uh, one year to two years. You know, to, and there is a queue, a waiting period. Uh, uh, you need a production slot to get this uh, piece of equipment. And Russians probably uh, knew this. Uh, I believe that the uh, Russian uh, energy professionals, that they, they advise their military they know where to attack, what to destroy, and they destroy this specifically built, specifically designed and produce equipment. And the main problem right now is to get this equipment because the, the most obvious way is to produce it. But for this, we need time and slots, production slots. There's the second, uh, the, the other parts of the equipment like circuit breakers or uh, other small pieces, uh, Piece small, small size equipment. It's more or less, uh, it's more or less uh, commodity. We can buy it, uh, but the price also is very high. Like one circuit breaker could cost you 150, 120 uh, thousand, uh, uh, hundred thousand dollars or euros. So it's expensive, expensive equipment. Uh, and again, you need to, and, and again, to mo in most cases, you need to, pr to produce it because uh, companies, uh, they don't keep it uh, in stock if, since because, because it's expensive. So what we can do right now quickly, we can uh, ask companies, uh, production companies or distribution or DCO or TCO to check their stocks. Maybe they have secondhand equipment, used equipment, maybe even not something that we could repair or we can use for spare parts. Um, maybe somebody bought something but did not uh, use for their project that can they can wait and uh, give us that equipment so as a as technical assistant uh, or we can buy it using the uh, financing from EBRD, European Bank uh, and other sci-fi's. So this is the quickest way to, to, to get something ready. And then in parallel, we need to order equipment because we need a stock for the future attacks they will come for sure russians will not stop we'll need to have it and uh, uh, be ready uh, to accept this uh, equipment in in march in february in may next year so is there something uh, that's done to actually speed it up by the companies given you know how long it takes in under normal circumstances have the companies outside of ukraine committed to some kind of a faster expedite deliveries or so on beyond those you know the the the, the other ways in which to make it faster uh to get the equipment some uh, some companies like schneider for example or siemens we ask them to check their stocks they run uh, checks in their stocks provided us the list of uh, ready equipment that we can buy from their stock uh in cases where where they can uh, negotiate with their clients that uh, this uh, produced uh, equipment can be sent us as a priority supply, so this is the first way. 
The second way, some of the companies, uh, they uh, agreed to put extra orders into production now, specifically for us. So basically created a, a, for us a separate production slots. The second way. The third way, like uh, Polish companies like uh, PSE, for example, so is Polish TCO, they have something in stock, ready used equipment. They did some upgrades. They built, they bought new transformers and just they have something in stock as a reserve old equipment. We can also take in, take in this equipment. So various, uh, various ways, uh, post all options are explored. We don't need, in many cases, don't need new equipment. We can use any equipment that can be installed, even if it's not perfectly matched in terms of specification, but it still may perform. We, we, we need it. We need it. Um, so when you get all this equipment and when you are attacked, how does your work look like? How um, can you describe in real time what it means to be DTAC and, uh, and its workers? Um, how do you repair the grids? How, um, how you fortify critical infrastructure? Okay, so, so far uh, we, uh, as, a, as DTAC, we uh, repaired uh, a low voltage equipment in, uh, um, in Kiev region and Kiev, uh, Kiev city. Um, in terms of the uh, recent attacks in October, uh, all our plants, six uh, thermal power generation plants were attacks. I can just can give you this example. Let's assume um, yesterday attack. So uh, once we have an air raid alert, all people go to the shelter, except several people who are staying in the control room because they could not go. They need to control the uh, uh, operation of the plant. Attacks uh, take uh, takes place. Uh, people in shelter hear how the anti-missile protection system works. Then they can hear the explosions. Uh, they understand that something that happened. After the air alert uh, signal is over, people go out from the shelter and see what happened. Basically, they go to the switch yard and see that the transformer, unit transformer, for example, was hit uh, from the vertical, uh, by the vertical attack uh, by the mice. And it's burning because the, there's a big transformer, like a three floor building um, full of oil because the oil is used to cool the transformer. It's like big fire that you can see. It's impossible to distinguish it because it's too much oil inside and the only way just look, wait and see how to, when the fire is over. You, of course, you can protect the neighbor equipment just kind of cut uh, using the water, uh, uh, cut the spread of uh, fire to the neighboring equipment. So uh, fire brigades works and extinguished. After it's done, then you see what happened to the to the transformer or to circuit breakers uh, next to the transformer, to switches, uh, to wires, etc. Then you just decide what to do. If it's possible to uh, repair repair the switch break uh, the the circuit breakers, for example, you, you people start repairing. We have something now stock. We just change. Uh, we connect wires. Uh, we take out the debris. Uh, then you need to check the uh, turbine, you need to check the, um, uh, the boiler, uh, you need to check the generator because everything was stopped at the emergency, not it's going to the normal procedure. When it's emergency stop, the uh, uh, ball rollers, et cetera, being damaged, you need to change them. Um, in our case, uh, with the transformer, we could not just start the unit because uh, we don't have another uh, unit transformer. It's specifically designed for this unit and for a specific uh, transformation level uh, that we need. So the only way is to, uh, to, is to maybe check for the similar uh, transformer and try to talk to the designers, uh, the producers, and somehow to redesign of a similar but not identical transformer. But in this particular case, we'll not be able to, to run the unit until we have a new transformer. In other cases, when the unit transformer is not damaged uh, uh, during the one week or two week or three weeks, we repair the switch yard equipment, switch or circuit breakers, assemble a new scheme, and then start the equipment after it's ready and the grid operator is ready to accept it. 
So that is the usual way how to how we approach uh, how we approach the results of the attack. So, but beyond what's visible, there are also other types of attacks, right? There are these cyber attacks that um, we've seen reporting of uh, on uh, from the Russian side. Um, can you address how you fortify fortify against cyber attacks? Yeah, there is such formation uh, in the Russian army called uh, cyber. Uh, cyber army, Russian cyber army is a real unit. This is not a uh, fake. It's a real department uh, in their army. What they do, they track, try to attack the critical infrastructure systems, including us. Uh, there are there are several attacks already. They are very professionally uh, professionally designed and implemented. Um, we um, starting from 9, 200, uh, 2018, we have a uh, energy security uh, strategy that's provide a very detailed roadmap, what systems we need to buy and install and implement in order to protect our systems uh, in both uh, the technological systems uh, and the, um, the IT within our company, which not belong to the technological system. And we procured a lot and installed a lot of equipment. We have very uh, talented and professional team uh, in our uh, IT security, uh, departments, uh, many of them work previously for law enforcement agencies, many of them have experience outside of Ukraine, and uh, they share the experiences regularly with the local law enforcement agencies with other specialists. And basically, we were managed to detect those attacks, successfully uh, defend our equipment, and uh, the uh, Russian cyber army did not succeed with our system. They tried. The attack took place uh, almost three weeks. Um, they did a, a. They accompanied this with the public announcement that we are wait, we are coming after you. So we have your data. Here is uh, the uh, some examples, but those were old data that is available online. Online with search group by Google. So they were even spreading uh, publicly that they already they have. Uh, uh, malls in our systems, uh, those malls uh, transfer them internal data. So, but the the team worked perfectly. Uh, we we managed to sustain that psychological threat. We did not go after their suggestions. Let's go to do something. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are right now feel much more comfortable with that. We regularly do the penetration test by ourselves. Basically, we hire people who uh, we pay to hack us um, and check for all vulnerabilities. Uh, that is the best practice, by the way, in the world uh, of uh, cybersecurity. And that is uh, important because real damage is bad, but uh, leakage of information, it's even worse because uh, in this case, they know everything about us. And if they know everything about us, it's very difficult to defend ourselves. That's that's right. Um, you've mentioned at some point, you know, about the rolling blackouts and and how pe people being affected. What percentage of grid is down um, in terms of also, but how many thermal plants? I mean, thermal plants are going to be crucial now that the weather is getting cold. How many thermal plants are down and what challenges you associate with this? So um, since we have this six wave for uh, uh, the uh, thermal plant, uh, what Russians did, they did a several rounds of attacks. During the first round, they hit all thermal power plants. And uh, two plants right now, no, one, no, two plants are right now staying without operation. Mm, uh, one is in the east, and the second is our plant that was damaged yesterday. All other plants uh, that were damaged, that were, they, were, they, they were stopped after the attacks, uh, but we managed to repair them. We managed to repair, not all of them worked 100%, some of them partially, but still they are under operation. The second uh, attack or the third attack, I don't remember uh, already, they hit uh, all hydro plants. All hydro plants in Ukraine, they attack. Um, one of the hydro plants is still, is still stopped. They could not still could not recover. Then they twice, uh, no, three times basically, they, they attacked the substations of the TCO. 
and uh, many of substations is uh, totally destroyed or partially destroyed uh, and 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 is not uh, supplied with the energy so right now i would uh, guess that uh, more than six more than 60 percent was damaged since beginning of the attacks mm, much of the facilities many of the facilities were repaired and restored and attacks the second and the third time they said uh, the uh, Russian military, they advise with energy professionals that they know where to hit and repeat the attacks, assess the result, and repeat again to get the result, and again assess. They went. I'm sure that they have walls in our system. They wait for information, and they repeat the attacks when the, we repair, install new equipment, and bring back uh, the equipment into the grid, and then repeat. Uh, Again, destroy and wait until we we, we recover. Well, that's um, definitely a tall order for any anybody at any given point. Um, and uh, it's not uh, like Ukraine is experiencing it just now. This has been going on for, for months. But let's kind of fast forward. Now, you will need a lot of equipment, a lot of uh, help, a lot of uh, both financial uh, also and um, potentially cyber services and so on. But let's fast forward and look beyond the war. Um, the war is over. Ukraine is fully disconnected from Russia. Uh, what is being discussed to maximize, maximize resiliency and reliability and, and integrate into a greener energy future as, as the EU is uh, striving for? Right now, we all understand that the key for our resilience is effective anti-missile uh, protection system. Mm -hmm. I think that future of any Ukrainian energy objects uh, any design uh, of the uh, any facility that will be developed would 100% provide for a specific part called uh, protection against the attacks. <laughs> that would be a new chapter on every design, and it is reality, a new normality of a uh, new normal for our life. Um, second, of course, uh, we will try to build everything protected uh, from civil point of view. Probably. Um, many of new substations will be will built underground. There are some designs for that, and we have experience in Kyiv where there is not enough space. Uh, many sub in many countries, in many cities, uh, substations built underground, and that would be, of course, the good protection. But so this is the the consequences of the war. Uh, looking forward, in terms of uh, generation mix, of course, uh, we need to. Uh, to need, we need to continue the country development of renewables because uh, uh, green energy, uh, this is energy that is not related to Russian gas and oil and coal. And wind and solar, this is the future, not only Ukrainian system, but also European energy system. And this is not only about the, uh, the decarbonization, not about the climate change, Right now, uh, it's about being independent from uh, Ukraine, Russian energy uh, weapon, uh, basically being independent uh, from this perspective. Ukraine did a lot during the last uh, four years. Uh, we managed to increase, to reach uh, the share of renewables uh, uh, in the energy mix of 8%. Ukraine invested um, well, companies in Ukraine invested almost $12 billion of uh, foreign direct investments for development of renewable. That was a great success, great success, because there's a, a rapid development uh, of renewables. As a company, we have, we, before the war, we had a strategy, which has not changed much, actually. We had an ambition to be carbon neutral by uh, 2040. We had an ambition, uh, amb ambitious plan for the country to build 30 megawatt of renewables by 2030. Uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, is relevant right now because after the uh, big share of renewables, the balancing capacities would come, this energy, uh, battery storage, for example, as a green hydrogen would come as a new source of energy and uh, small modular reactors uh, also would come. Uh, we first uh, we were the first company who built the uh, industrial energy storage in Ukraine, energy storage in Ukraine, one megawatt 
um, energy uh, battery. Right now, despite of the war, we developed the project to build 20 megawatt uh, uh, energy uh, battery, uh, industrial energy, uh, industrial energy storage facility. And we are doing this with American company called Honeywell. Uh, we are trying to attract financing and build this because the storage is needed to balance the system. Uh, the future is about mix mixing together renewables, solar and wind, uh, battery storage facilities, hydrogen production, uh, and of course the small model reactors that will keep will be, I think it will be substitution for the thermal generation. And that is partial right now doing the, not only the balancing, but also the uh, base load. So it's all about, uh, uh, it's all about our strategy. We have, we have everything in our strategy and um, somebody asked us, uh, would our strategy change because of the war? We always say, no, it will not change. We'll just postpone its implementation. For the time of the war and later after the victory of ukraine i believe it will take uh, sooner or later uh, we will just continue implement our strategy that we designed before the war because nothing changed strategically we are going to europe as a country we are going uh, to base our future in energy sector based on renewables green hydrogen balancing capacities in the in the form of the battery storages. And this is the way in which the whole world is uh, basically moving, except Russia, of course, because they are moving in the opposite direction. Right, and I think there's also uh, one uh, could mention that uh, Ukraine is a home to uh, many critical minerals that uh, could be will be instrumental for development of green energy, and as such can offer quite a lot of the um, the energy security as we develop uh, greener grids and as we move to uh, to net and net zero future. Um, uh, we know that uh, uh, Mr. Timchenko was at COP. Um, do you have any uh, news from him? Of how Ukraine was, uh, how was the reception uh, that he was given and what type of deliberation he was involved about the Ukra Ukrainian energy future there? Yes, uh, Ukraine, this year, Ukraine as uh, a country was very active uh, uh, at COP. Um, the tech uh, supported um, uh, building and promoting Ukrainian pavilion uh, at, at COP. The reception was uh, very, very good. Uh, I would say even great. Many delegations uh, attended uh, Ukrainian pavilion, including uh, top uh, top officials uh, from Europe, uh, from uh, from the states, uh, uh, like John Kerry, for example, uh, Nancy Pelosi, um, Timmerman, and all other uh, high high rank officials. They. Uh, you know, they, they attended the Ukrainian pavilion. They understand the challenges uh, in which, uh, uh, which Ukrainian uh, is experiencing now. Uh, they're ready to help. Uh, they share our desire as a country, uh, as a company as well, because we are active participants of that to, uh, build, uh, and to build new energy of Ukraine based on the renewables, uh, the battery storages, based on the hydrogen, and based on small model reactors. And this is the inspiration shared among many companies in Ukraine that's also participating in COP. So I, I think that was a was a good event, uh, a good promotion of Ukrainian desire to be in line with Ukraine with the international agenda, to not be uh, not be outsider of the new trends uh, or current trends, and uh, ability, a confirmation of ability of Ukraine to 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 go in line with those trends. Yeah, which is also important, and of course, the great resilience. Uh, despite of all those attacks, um, Ukrainians uh, believe that uh, they will win. Uh, they're doing everything possible to go through that war, to beat the enemy, uh, to support the army, to support the economy, uh, to go through the challenges, uh, and at the end, uh, prevail. And that is a unique situation. I think uh, the. Uh, Willing to, the belief uh, that Ukrainians would do that is growing right now, and uh, the the attitude is totally different in comparison with the beginning of February or the end of the February, sorry, and and and, and today, and it's a big, uh, big uh, also big uh, challenge for Ukrainian people to 
not to spoil this trust, not to spoil this uh, desire to help. But I'm sure it will not. So. I am sure they will not. I, uh, what Ukrainians have shown, their resilience, they, uh, their ability to work under extreme pressure has been un unmatched, truly. And we are all in out uh, of, of, of all Ukrainians, including those that are working for keeping the lights on and the heat uh, in the uh, Ukrainian homes. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks. We really appreciate you taking your time. I will um, uh, I will turn now uh, to the closing remarks uh, by uh, Ken Medlock. For sure. Thank you. Dimitro, uh, thank you so much for your um, for spending time with us today. Uh, it was an incredibly informative discussion. Um, hopefully everybody online was able to. Uh, get as much as I was able to get out of this conversation. It was it was truly remarkable to hear the challenges and and how you're stepping up to meet those challenges um, as you move forward. Uh, I also want to comment uh, just for everybody when uh, Mr. Timchenko uh, let us know he was not able to join us. Um, there was a lot of uh, apology shared, and um, I found that remarkable because there is no apology necessary. The circumstances that you you are all operating in are something that none of us can can really even relate to. So um, again, I want to thank you sincerely um, and wish you the best as you as you navigate this this really challenging time in front of you. Um, and to everybody, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, as usual, uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you again uh, at a time in the near future. Thank you very much.